gracious and all wise God, we come before you, Lord, just saying thank you. We thank you for this cool but beautiful day that you've given us. Um, and you've allowed our moments to roll on just a little while longer. Uh, you've allowed us to participate in those activities that you would have us to do this day. Because this is a day that uh, you've made. And regardless of how things may be good or how things may be bad, uh, it's a day that you've given us to rejoice because our lives are all built about uh, for you and for your glory. Lord, I thank you for each person that's on this call. I thank you for those that are about to join us. Ask your continued blessings of protection, your continued blessings of prosperity. Uh, just you thinking about us to, to keep blessing us, Lord, it is uh, awesome. And for that, Lord, I'm grateful. Lord, now for this lesson today, I ask that you open up our minds that we may be receptive to it, open our hearts that we may internalize it, and ultimately you get the praise, glory, and honor that you are due as a result of us sharing this lesson with others. We love you, we bless you, we praise you, we magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we are in the third lesson of our series, Don't Forget to Remember. Uh, the title of the series is Remember. And the title of our lesson today is Don't Forget to Remember. Uh, and there are essentially three ways we need to look to so that we don't forget to remember. We need to look to the past, which is looking backward, and we'll remember how God brought us. We need to look to the present uh, by looking upward and recognize that it was him that it did it. It wasn't us. And we need to look to the future. We need to look forward and realize how we got where we are today. And we're reminded uh, where all our help comes from in Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, where it says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And as we... Remember, uh, back in 1976, Eddie Robinson, Eddie Robertson wrote these lyrics. He says, when you get a little money and get on your feet, why do you change? But what God has blessed you with is more than you need. Why can't you remain the same? Today may be as bright as the morning sun. Tomorrow may be dark. And everything gone. Don't forget to remember where all your blessings come from. And in our lesson today, Moses is about to call the children of Israel to remember some things. Now, there is a new generation that's about a month out from entering they're on the east bank of the Jordan River, and they're about to enter into the Promised Land. And the adults of the generation, which had left Egypt, with the exception of a few of them, are basically dead. And they are dead because they were disobedient. They had broken God's law. Those were considered sins of commission. And when they got or when they get to the gates or when they get to the entryway of the promised land, they sort of fail to believe God. Those are sins of omission. So one of the things that you need to note is that unbelief is a sin. 
Now, what they had been relying on and what they were, had received was the law. The law was good, but it gets weak through the flesh. It was the flesh that was wrong then, and it's the flesh that's wrong today. In our flesh, there's nothing good. That's why God had to do something different. And he had to do things a different way, and that different way that he used or he uses still today is called grace. This is the reason that God has an altogether different basis on which he saves, which is grace. Now, this new generation uh, has now grown from adulthood. Now, remember, let's see, prayerfully everybody on this call, with the exception of maybe one, uh, is over 40 years old. Now imagine um, everybody that was around you 40 years ago, how many of them are still around today? Just imagine if you all lived in the same community. Imagine uh, perchance that you still all lived in the California community. So that meant 40 years ago, all those that had children, all those that had grandchildren, all those that had great-grandchildren, great-great-great-grandchildren, and you all still live in the same community, imagine. 40 years ago, how many of them would not be present today. So, as I said, this new generation, now grown to adult, needed to have a law interpreted for them in light of their 40 years that they've been, been in the wilderness. So Moses gives them, this new generation, his final instructions from God before he turns things over to death. Uh, because the big Mo is not going to be able to get to the promised land right now. And now I'll explain what I mean by right now in a little bit. But God thought highly of Moses. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, we read that now Moses was a quietly humble man, more so than anyone living on earth. So, when Miriam and Aaron starts talking about the sister that he chose to be his wife, God wasn't pleased. So God had to take Miriam and Aaron to the woodshed. He said, listen, listen carefully what I'm about to tell you. If there is a prophet of God among you, I make myself known to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But I don't do it that way with my servant Moses. He has the run of my entire house. I speak to him intimately, in person, in plain talk, without riddles. He ponders the very form of God. So, after all Moses had done, remember he uh, had done several things for the children of Israel. He stood before Pharaoh and told Pharaoh that God said, let his people go. He led those stiff-necked uh, people out of Egypt. He went up to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights to get the law but he doesn't get to go to the promised land at this time. He will appear in the promised land on the Mount of Transfiguration, but that's later on down the road. So there's a lesson here that we need to realize, and that lesson is we are not exclusive. God doesn't need us. We need him. However, 
He can use us to do what he wants done. We just have to be willing. And by that, sometimes that means be willing to go through some things. Sometimes that means losing some people along the way, which can be very painful, very hurtful. But there still means that there's something that God would have us to do. So he reviews the desert experiences. He emphasizes certain features of the law, and he reveals their future course in light of the covenant that God made with him to the land of promise. In other words, Moses is calling them to remember. Now, the first thing that we need to note for the Israelites as well as for us God didn't save us because we're great. God didn't save us because we're grand. And God didn't save us because we're good. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 10, we see God wasn't attracted to you because you didn't, because he wasn't attracted to you. He didn't choose you because you were big and important. The fact is, there was almost nothing to you. Here's why he did it. He did it out of sheer love. An additional reason is he is keeping the promise he made to your ancestors. God stepped in and mightily brought you back out of the world of slavery. Uh-oh. There's some things we're still slaves to freed you from the iron grip of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know this, God, your God, is indeed God, a God you can depend on. <laughs> I can stop right there. That, that's all I need to know. He keeps his covenant of loyal love with those who love him and observe his commandments for the thousand generations. But he also pays back those who hate him. And how does he pay them? He pays them with wages of death. He isn't slow to pay them all. Those who hate him, he pays right on time. Now, he doesn't pay them in on our timetable. He pays them on his table, timetable. He's right on time. So here it is, your time to respond. Uh, the first point to ponder. How often do you stop and think about what God has done for you and why he did it? What makes you so special that you wasn't part of the half a million people that died from COVID-19? COVID Anybody care to respond? Star six to respond. All righty. David, I feel like he's got more work for me to do. There you go. For the, for the, in the house, yeah. <laughs> And with him having more work for you to do, that means that there's some things that you need to be making yourself readily available for, right? Amen. All right. I'm ready for me. He's not ready for you. Oh, my God. Look what happened. Well, here's something else for you to think about. That perhaps he has blessed you because he made a promise to your ancestors. He might have made a promise to my grandfather, who was a pastor. How often do you think of his goodness to you? Now, some of you uh, don't really think of 
that good state until you get into a point where you have some problems. Um, now, there are some of you that do think of his goodness quite often, but many of us don't. So, here's what we need to remember. God saved Israel because, and saved us, because of his goodness. Nahum 1.7 says, and I'm reading from the message translation, God is good, a hiding place in rough times. He recognizes and welcomes anyone looking for help. And then in Matthew 19 and 17, Jesus said, why do you question me about what is good? God is the one who is good. If you want to enter the life of God, just do what he tells you. So, he saved us because of his goodness. He saved us because of his grace. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is a result it is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. You not saved because you so good or so pretty. <laughs> uh, you're saved because of God's grace. And Romans 4 and 16 says, this is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely on trusting God and his way. And then simply embracing him and what he does, God's promise arrives as pure gift. That's the only way everyone can be sure to get in on it. Those who keep the religious trans traditions and those who have never heard from him. Here it is. For Abraham is father to us all, or of us all. He is not our racial father. That's reading the story backwards. He is our faith father. So, what we see here is salvation doesn't come through the law. It comes through grace. That means that he saved us because of his goodness. He saved us because of his grace. And ultimately, he saved us because of his glory. Now, many times God's glory has our fingerprints all over it because we love to steal his glory. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 24, verse 17 says, Those at the bottom of the mountain saw the, the awesome light. The glory of the Lord at the mountain top looked like a raging fire. And then in Psalm 19, verse 1, he says, How clearly the sky reveals God's glory. How paint plainly it shows what he has done. So, there are some things that Moses reminds the new generation of Israelites and sort of reminds us as well. Um, and... We're, we're going to take a look at that. There are three main things that he's going to remind us. And our lesson today primarily is coming from Deuteronomy chapter 9. So, starting at verse 1, it says, Listen, O Israel, today you're about to cross the Jordan River to take over the land belonging to the nations much greater and more powerful than you. They live in cities with walls that reach to the skies. The people are strong and tall, descendants of the famous Anakite giants. You've heard the saying, who can stand up to the Anakites? Now, let me pause right here, because one of the things that we all have in our lives is some giants. The children of Israel we're about to come face to face and going to be in hand-to-hand -hand combat 
with some people that were conservatively seven foot to nine foot tall, over nine foot tall. These people were called the Anakites or the Anakin. Uh, they were also known as the Raphim, the Emum, the Nephilim. And one of the most memorable Anakites that we'll read about stood nine feet, nine inches tall. His name was Goliath. And the Lord let little David conquer that giant to everyone's amazement. Now, the giants we face today are a little different unless you are a professional basketball player. Some of our modern-day giants are struggles with drugs, alcohol, sexual addictions. Uh, there are even some that are still uh, struggling with pride. And basically, a giant is anything that comes between us and God. And that interference is usually because we can't defeat that giant. So, here's a question that uh, as you're facing your giant, as you're about to enter into that promised land that you've been called into, who, who's settling on the land that occupies your time, your effort, your energy, and who is keeping you from marching into your land of promise? Who's on your land? Who's stealing what is meant for you? Doesn't matter uh, if they're named the Hittites, the Amorites, the uh, Uncleites, best friendites, the boyfriendites, girlfriendites. Some of you have the kidites and the coworkerites. Somebody's always around to steal something. But I want you to realize what verse three says. But recognize today that the Lord your God is the one who will cross over ahead of you like a devouring fire to destroy them. He will subdue them so that they will quickly conquer, so you will quickly conquer them and drive them out, just as the Lord had promised. Now, 40 years ago, they'd already had that promise. Remember, Moses sent over 12 spies in Numbers chapter 13, and 10 brought back a bad report, and only two said we could conquer them. And the kept saying that they look like grasshoppers in their eyes, and the land is fruitful, but the giants are present. Now, what the Lord is saying right here in verses 1 and 2 seem even more fri frightful than our frightening what the spies had said. But verse 3 is the critical verse. Yes, there are giants in the land. Yes, there are walled cities. Yes, there are a lot of things. But the Lord is going ahead to destroy them. Verse 3 again, but recognize today that the Lord your God is the one who will cross over ahead of you like a devouring fire to destroy them. He will subdue them so that they, you will, so that you will quickly conquer them and drive them out just as the Lord has promised. He would have done that 40 years earlier, as I said, but they had to embellish their report. They didn't believe that God was with them. So there are a few things that, Moses is going to remind this new generation, and he's reminding us today. The first thing that we need to remember is who you are. And you need to parallel who you are with who your enemy is. 
Uh, you are small, you're weak, and your enemy is great and strong. So those parallels. But, and you need to also remember that Israel was nothing special, and they were no match for the people that were there. But who do they have on their side? They had God on their side. Who do we have on our side? We have God on our side. Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, which is also going to be a part of our lesson next week, verses 17 and 18, says, If you start thinking to yourselves, I did all of this, and all by myself. I'm rich, and it's all mine. Well, think again. Remember that God, your God, gave you the strength to produce all this wealth, so as to confirm the covenant that he promised to your ancestors as it is today. What we need to remember is we did nothing on our own. Our ancestors may have promised uh, a B.J. Miller era, may have promised that they, the church property would not just be in the middle of the block between the alley and Kentucky Street. He might have shown them that there's going to be enough land to take care of the whole block, that, uh, that our church property would encompass the whole block. We don't know because they're not around to tell us. God may have revealed a whole lot of things to them. God may have promised a whole lot of things to them. But we don't need to be like the guy that's in Luke chapter 12. Uh, starting at verse 16, he says, Jesus told him this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. He talked to himself. That can be a good thing or a bad thing. We won't talk about that right now. What can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll gather in all my grain and goods. And I'll say to myself, self, You've done well. You've made it. You've got it made and can now retire. Take it easy. Have the time of your life. Just then God shows up and said, fool. <laughs> when God calls you a fool, you're a fool. Tonight you die. And your barn full of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. So, first thing we need to remember is who you are. You're nothing. It's only through God's help that you're able to do anything. The second thing you need to remember is whose you are. Because, as it says there in verse 3, Recognize today that the Lord your God is the one who will cross over ahead of you, will, he's coming ahead and will be like a defire, devouring fire to destroy them. He will subdue them so that you can do your part, and your part is to quickly conquer them and drive them out, because that's what God has promised. All right, so we serve a God who's able to do some things. That's who we are. We're, we're gods. We serve a God who is, first off, able. What is he able to do? He is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power 
and work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we can ask or think. Now, I don't know if you have a good imagination like I do, but here's the thing. No matter how much you think about God can do, we don't, our minds can't even scratch the surface. Rev said Sunday that Mary Oliver in a poem said, some words will never leave God's mouth no matter how hard you listen. You won't hear him say no more, no more love. I ain't got no more love for you. I ain't got no more strength. I've run out of mercy, patience, or grace because he's able. He's able to do. Not only is do we serve a God who is able, but he is attentive. Psalm 116 verse 1 says, I love God because he listened to me, listened as I begged for mercy. The songwriter penned it and said that I love the Lord because he heard my voice and pitied my every groan. Then Psalm 40 and 1 says, I waited and waited and waited for God. At last he looked, finally he listened. So he's able, he's attentive, he's awesome. Deuteronomy 7 and 21 says, No, do not be afraid of those nations, for the Lord your God is among you, and he is great and awesome. Because we serve an awesome God. Not only is he awesome, he's authentic. He's the real thing. Colossians 2 and 17 says, These things are like a shadow of what is to come. But what is true and real has come and is found in Christ. A shadow has no substance. If you walk in and there's a shadow with you, uh, that shadow is going to disappear when the light goes away. But one thing that we need to be sure of, and that one thing is that God is real. That's the one thing that we all can be sure of. So not only is he authentic, he's affectionate. How affectionate is he? John 3.16 says, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have whole, have a whole and lasting life. And then in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, he says, The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God. Because God is love. So you can know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Not that we once uh, upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and God sent his son as a sacrifice to clear the way our sins and the damage they've done in our relationship with God. So that's why to this day, hearing the lyrics to the song, Yes, Jesus Loves Me, it carries such a different meaning today than it did when I was a child and was learning the song. Because just the thought that he still loves me despite some of the things I've done, that's real love. That's authentic love. So he's also accessible. James 4 and 8 says, come close to God and he will come close to you. How do we come close to God? We come close to God in prayer. And more importantly than anything else on that list, God is amazing. Habakkuk 3 and 2 says, I've heard all about you, Lord. 
I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. Instead of, like we talked about last week, if we were ants, uh, if we as human were ants, the fact that he became one of us to do a specific task rather than becoming the anteater, we, we got to know how amazing that is. And then in Psalm 96, verse 3, he said, Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. So, so far we need to note who you are. You need to remember who you are. Secondly, you need to remember whose you are because our God is just off the chain. And then the third thing that we need to remember is what you are. And we see this in Deuteronomy chapter 9. And this is a lengthy passage, uh, starting at verse 6, but it's a crucial passage. 6 through 17 says, You must recognize that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land because you're good. Remember, we already said we ain't good. For you are not. What are you? You're a stubborn people. Remember and never forget how angry you made the Lord your God out in the wilderness. From the day you left Egypt until now, you have been constantly rebelling against him. Even in Mount Sinai, you made the Lord so angry he was ready to destroy you. This happened while I was on the mountain receiving the tablets of stone inscribed with the words of the covenant that the Lord had made with you. I was there for 40 days and 40 nights. And all that time I ate no food and drank no water. The Lord gave me two tablets on which he'd written with his own finger all the words he had spoken to you from the heart of the fire when you were assembled at the mountain. At the end of the 40 days and nights, the Lord handed me the two stone tablets inscribed with the words of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, Up, get up, go down immediately, for the people you brought out of Egypt have corrected themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They've melted gold and made an idol for themselves. The Lord also said to me, I have have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Leave me alone, so I may destroy them and erase their name from under the heaven. Then I will make a mighty nation of your descendants, a nation larger and more powerful than they are. So while the mountain was blazing with fire, I turned and came down, holding in my hands the two tablets, two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. There below me, I could see that you'd sinned against the Lord your God. You'd melted gold and made a calf idol for yourselves. How quickly you had turned away from the path the Lord had commanded you to follow. So I took the stone tablets and threw them to the ground, smashing them before your eyes. Verse 21. I took your sin, which was the calf you made, and I melted it into the fire, ground it into dust, then threw the dust into the stream which flows from the mountain. You made the Lord angry at Tabera, at Massa, at Kibrath, Hadabaya, And at Kadesh Barnea, the Lord sent you out with this command, Go up and take over the land I've given you. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord, your God, 
and refuse to put your trust in him or obey him. Yes, you have been rebelling against the Lord as long as I've known you. And I'm sick of you now. No, he didn't say that, but that that was in essence. So what are you? You first off think a little bit too highly of yourselves because you're stick neck people. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are as a church? All the other churches are opening up, but why can't we uh, kill that noise? You're going to church. All you got to do is use what God has provided for you to be able to worship. You also have a slave mentality. That slave mentality for them was back when they were in Egypt, how good things were. That slave mentality for us still exists. Back when I was in Alabama and Mississippi, we had it good. Yeah, you lived in a dirt shack and things wasn't really that good because you couldn't go to certain parts without other people coming to make sure that you were out of there. You're stubborn people. Everybody always wants some somebody. Uh, they want somebody to do something for them without them having to do anything for themselves. That ain't good enough. You're sinful people. So once you see what you are, the next thing that you need to note is why you are and where you are. And we see this starting in verse 4. After the Lord your God has done this for you, in other words, after he's already taken care of the land, remember verse 3, said he's going ahead to do some things. After the Lord has your God has done this for you, don't say in your hearts, the Lord has given us this land because we are such good people. He's reminding you of good. Again, you ain't no good. No. It is because of the wickedness of the other nations that he is pushing them out of your way. It is not because you are so good or have such integrity that you're about to occupy their land. The Lord your God will drive these nations out ahead of you only because of their wickedness and to fulfill the oath he swore to your ancestors, uh-oh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. How do you know God allowed your moments to roll on uh, it ain't because you were great. We're standing on the promises God made to somebody else. David said in Psalm 37, verse 25, I was once young. Now I have a gray beard. Not once have I seen an abandoned believer or his kids out roaming the streets. Verse 18. Then, as before, I threw myself down before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water because of the great sin you committed by doing what the Lord hated, provoking him to anger. I feared that the furious anger of of the Lord, which turned him against you, would drive him to destroy you. But again, he listened to me. The Lord was so angry with Aaron that he wanted to destroy him too, but I prayed for Aaron, and the Lord spared him. That is why I threw myself down before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. For the Lord said he would destroy you. I prayed to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, do not destroy them. They are your own people. They are your special possession, whom you redeemed from Egypt. 
by your mighty power and your strong hand. Please overlook the stubbornness and the awful sin of these people and remember instead your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you destroy these people, the Egyptians will say, the Israelites died because the Lord wasn't able to bring them out of the land, and he promised to give them. Or they might say he destroyed them because he hated them. He deliberately took them into the wilderness to slaughter them. Here's the key. But they are your people, God, and they are your special possession whom you brought out of Egypt by your great strength and powerful arm. So you need to remember who you are, whose you are, what you are, method, why you are, and where you are. The first thing you need to remember is somebody prayed for you, had you on their mind. They took the time to pray for you. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 25, as this translation says, when I was on my face prostrate before God those 40 days and nights after God said he would destroy you. He laid before the Lord. Our ancestors probably did the same. Um, so that we would not be killed while we were out doing our myths. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 says, When Daniel learned that the law had been signed, in other words, the law prohibiting prayer, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he'd always done, giving thanks to his God. So, you cannot stop prayer. It's our most wonderful weapon, but we don't use it. But remember I said somebody prayed for you? They had you on their mind. You weren't even conceived, but they had you on your mind. And then we have in Matthew chapter 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount, here's what I want you to do first. Find a quiet, secluded place so that you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will sense his grace. You will sense his presence. So remember somebody prayed for you. Recognize solely that you're here solely by God's grace. Can't speak for anybody else, but I'm a grace case. And that grace has been freely given. Psalm 48 and 11 says, For the Lord is our sun and shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. He'll also block some bad stuff. <laughs> That's some great news right there. Acts chapter 13, verse 43. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. So that grace is freely given, and it's promised to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5, and First Peter chapter five verse five says, "In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble." Now, this doesn't always apply to young people. Because there are some foolish old people. You didn't do anything to earn that grace. You didn't do anything to receive that mercy. 
but it was given to you today. In fact, you didn't even receive, you didn't do anything to receive that breath that you took that woke you up this morning. But he's promised some things. So, not only do we need to recognize that it's for God's grace, it's freely given, it's promised to the humble, and it's not for selfish use. Selfish use. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Your gift is for us to serve one another. So, prayerfully, there is something that has been said today that will trigger your memory. Anytime that you start to veer off course, that you will be brought back into alignment with what God would have you to do. And how do we do that? Well, first off, you need to thank God that regardless of your past, present, or your present, that you have a glorious future awaiting for you as a believer. Because we all need to be ready to tell somebody about Christ. Sometimes we need to use words when necessary. We need to be an ever-present example of how a Christ follower should respond in interacting with others. Sometimes we don't respond too kindly, especially those that are outside the faith. Then you have to hear this. I thought he was a Christian. I thought she was. You don't want to hear those words. So you need to be that ever-present example. And how do we know to be that example? Because we need to read God's word. We need to share with others how we are called to remember what Christ has done in our lives. There are some things that he's done for me that he might not have done for you. But here's that other part, is what he's done for me is probably something that's meant for somebody else, because that's just how God works. Yes, you might not have been a drunk. Yes, you might not have been a drug abuser. But because there is someone that has crossed my path that has a problem with alcohol, has a problem with drugs, I'm going to be able to tell them how that worked. You might have had a problem hopping from bed to bed and how God spared you. But just the same, until you share that story, somebody else is not going to know. You need to know that also your giving will help others be informed out of the value that Christ exhibits in their lives. Christ said, adds great value to everyone's life. And most importantly, you need to remember what a difference Christ has made in your life, especially when you encounter your value or your worthiness in Christ. Because there are many times that you don't feel worthy. You don't feel worthy of anything that God wants to bestow upon you. But just the same, be thankful because he does. That should make you love him even more. So next week's title is Remember Your Wilderness Experience. And all of us have had a wild time. If you haven't, it's because you've forgotten. That means you've gotten a little old and God need, might need to remind you of that wild time that you had. In any event, I thank you for joining us today. I love you. Uh, I thank God that he's going to use something in this lesson to help you along in your journey. Now we're going to take prayer requests. Any blessings that you have bestowed on us, Lord. Thank you for a new day that we've never seen before, Lord. Thank you for being in our right mind today, Lord. 
Oh, God, thank you for the activities of our limbs, Lord. Oh, God, thank you for a new set of mercies that you have provided for us today, Lord. We just want to give you glory, honor, and praise for all that you have done because you are so worthy, Lord. And we thank you for what you've done, Lord. And we thank you right now for what you're going to do, Lord. Oh, God, you heard the names called on that list today, William Spalding, Tony Pittman, the James, all of those that's needing your help right now, Lord. You see them, the one that had the stroke today, go yonder right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We plead the blood of Jesus over him, cover him in the name of Jesus. You touch his body right now, Lord. Oh, God, and you heal him from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, Lord. Oh, God, you look on every name that's called and dealing with sickness and affliction or whatever the condition may be, Lord, but you are a healer and you promised that you will heal our bodies, Lord. So we ask him that you heal in the name of Jesus, Lord. Take away the pain. Take away every uncomfortableness in their body right now and touch them in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus that you cover them right now, Lord. And you said by your stripes we are here, so they are here right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Oh, God, and we claim it in the name of Jesus. And we lift them up together in the oneness of the Spirit that you're healing their bodies, that you're delivering them from all those afflictions does not like you, Lord. Oh, God, and we ask that you look on that bereaved family today, the oldest member, Lord. Oh, God, be with her family. Comfort them in the name of Jesus, Lord. Speak comfort to words to them. Bless them in the name of Jesus. And go with them at this time of bereavement, Lord. Oh, God, and only you can strengthen them and help them and see them through this time of bereavement, Lord. And we ask that you do that, Lord. Oh, God, we know that you 